Our next panel is sponsored by the Horror Writers Association and includes some of the genre's premier writers to discuss the attraction and allure of writing dark fiction. Our panelists are Eric LaRocca, returning back, author of Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke. <laughs> Gus Marino, author of The Things Between Us. Lorian Lawrence, author of the Fright Watch series, most recently Unmasked. Clay McLeod Chapman, author of Ghost Eaters. And this panel will be moderated by John Palisano, author of Dust of the Dead. Please welcome our panelists. Liquid death for water. So refreshing. So satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, hello, 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 uh, Westport. Thank you, Story Fest, for having us. Um, yeah, it's clapping. Um, it's been a long time since, you know, we've been waiting to be back in person and it just, it's really exciting to be in person and to talk to people um, and, you know, live and not on Zoom for once. So, um, pretty cool. Thank you to Alex and everybody for setting this up. Um, but cool. And, and thank you all for coming and, and being a part of this panel. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. So let's dive right in. Um, my first question is, why do you think people are drawn to the dark stuff? Um, I can, I'll, I'll go first. Cool, cool. Um, I think because, like, in terms of dark fiction, like, it's one of the few genres that's, like, an emotion. Um, as for, you know, like, you got westerns, you got sci-fi. Um, but, like, horror or dark fiction, like, that's, that's an emotional thing. So, like, it can fit into, like, a lot of different stories. And I think it's something we all uh, face in our everyday lives that we want stories that like reflect that back to us in, in some way. Um, so I think that's the draw for like these dark stories that people seem to can't get enough of. Just like bouncing off that, I think dark fiction in general, like there's something really dangerous about reading dark fiction. You know, it's something that, I remember last night at the keynote, someone said, um, you know, reading feels like you're getting away with something sometimes, you know, and that's like dark fiction, I feel like. You know, it's taboo, it's like transgressive, it's all these things that maybe you shouldn't be reading, but you're like, you're just so compelled to continue turning the pages and you really do feel like you're reading something that you're not supposed to be reading, and that to me is what I love about dark fiction, is how impactful it is to the reader, how much, you know, the emotions it elicits from, from the reader. Um, it just feels like very taboo, very, um, just like something that is just off limits. And I think that that's really exciting. I totally agree with that. And I feel like there's electricity with dark fiction, horror, whatever you want to call it, that I don't know. Like, I haven't felt as much with other genres. I remember being in middle school and sneaking in to see the original Scream, best Scream, by the way, and with my best friend. And we had to be in the front row because we had to sneak in. And watching Ghostface like that for you know, an hour and a half, and the whole theater was just electrified. And I was like, I want to chase that forever, whatever that feeling was. Like, I want to read about it. I want to watch more things about it. It it might be that little sense of naughtiness, like I'm not supposed to be, you know, going down this road. But I love the electricity of like that instant visceral feeling it gives you. Yeah, it's. You know, you think of that big movie screen and you're sitting in the front row. I feel like a book is that movie screen right at your face. And it's the fact that when you close the book and you put the book down, that the claws of that book are now in your psyche. And it's, the ima it's your imagination that's doing the heavy lift. And you get to carry that book with you for the foreseeable future. And that, that to me, 
you know, the most impactful books are the ones that I have the experience, I read it, I engage, I put the book down, and then I have made this, this imaginary movie where I am the, the character or that whatever, whatever the force is of that book is now playing out within my house with the lights off. And I, yeah, you carry it with, with you wherever you go, and I love that. So you like the glutton of punishment type part of a yeah, well, dark fiction. I mean, Eric brought up, you know, the, the kind of transgressive quality to it. Like, a book transports you. It takes you somewhere. And, and dark fiction tends to take you... Like Hellraiser. Totally. <laughs> we have so much pleasures to show you. <laughs> yeah, so piggybacking off on that, what brought you to horror originally? Do you remember that moment where you're like, I'm going to write horror? So I was introduced to horror through my mom, actually. Um, she was really into like the old universal classic monster movies. And um, she let me watch Creature from the Black Lagoon when I was like nine. And it just like completely captured my heart and my imagination. And I knew I wanted to do something with horror. Um, and I just started, you know, writing as much as possible. But it really wasn't until I discovered um, like Clive Barker that I really was like, this is what I want to do. Um, that sort of transgressive, in your face, extreme horror with those like very erotic queer elements. Um, that to me was just so exciting. And it made me feel for the first time like I could sit at the table. Like all of the horror fiction and horror films that I encountered before reading like the Hellbound Heart and the Books of Blood, um, they were all very, um, you know, heteronormative. Like they just didn't really feature a lot of queer characters. Um, so delving into Barker's work and then like Poppy Z. Bright and Kathy Koja, um, Michael McDowell, um, you know, those writers really just captured my heart and made me realize like you can be queer and write this content. Um, and it can be really, really special. Awesome. You know, I, I think I wrote horror because um, I didn't think I could. Huh. Like, I, I'm someone who I'm, like, terrified of everything. Like, I think everything is scary. So, like, I was just always like, well, no one's going to think that things I think are scary are scary. Like, they're just going to think this is just, like, some bland book. Um, and then after a while, I was like, well, like, I should just try. Um, like, and there was actually something uh, Stephen Graham Jones said where um, it, it, I think the question was like, how are you like so prolific? And he was like, it's because I'm trying to get the story out of my head because uh, like I'm, I'm scared too. So I was like, oh, if, if he can admit to being scared, like maybe then I can do this too and it's okay for me to be scared while writing. Um, so like it started out as just basically like testing myself. Um, and then I just realized I was a glutton for punishment and, <laughs> and just like went with it. Nice. So there was the trailer for The Stuff, which just so happened to be uh, uh, right before Godzilla 1985. And it was Billy Droste's goddamn fifth birthday uh. where we're, wa we're, he we're gonna go see Godzilla 1985. And the trailer for The Stuff starts and if you've ever seen the stuff like the trailer is probably a little bit more terrifying than the actual movie the movie's great but the trailer it's like whatever you do do not eat the stuff and the stuff is all about killer ice cream and for a kindergartner to be experiencing this trailer it was mortifying it was it was phenomenal because i from that day forward it it like it, it kick-started this, this um, thing in my life which just so happened to dovetail into the uh, dissolving of my mother's marriage to my uh, stepfather. And this parallel personal experience had now this, this kind of, I don't want to say mask, but it, it had a, there was something to it, like a, like a face that was horrifying to me and for some reason the stuff that was going on the, the stuff that was going on in my family now had a monster 
and they were totally unrelated. It was just for the fact that they dovetailed into one another that I suddenly was codifying the, the kind of breakdown of our family with this monstrous killer ice cream. And from that day forward, I had night terrors for three years, and it was always because the stuff was coming out of my bedroom shadows to eat me. And my, none, none of, like, you know, family couldn't make sense of it. None of this would made sense to anybody, but I'd be like, the stuff, the stuff. And it, it like, at, at one point, my mother, like, it was, it, was, it was definitely that moment of, like, you have to do something. You have to articulate the feeling that you're feeling. You have to articulate what is, you know, therapy's not working. Talking this through with your family's not working. What is, what is the stuff? Like, what is the thing that is happening to you? And, and it, it, it really boiled down to, like, draw a picture or, you know, like, like, tell the, like, tell the story somehow. And by exorcising it, kind of like, you know, getting it out of the system, it became, it manifested itself into a, uh, a story. And, and that was the moment where it was like, oh my God, like you can take this, whatever's happening here, give it a face, give it a mask or some sort of artifice and articulate it. Um, and the audience may never know, the reader may never know where it comes from, what the root is, what the genesis is, but it is your story and it is your monster and you can... I don't know, there was something very catharsis about, cathartic about that. So, yeah, yeah. I was also five and got traumatized, but I guess in a good way, because my kindergarten, this was the 80s, and I've said this before, there were no rules. And in kindergarten, our library was in the basement, which is already terrifying. And it had... Um, all over the walls, it was just dark and really just abysmal down there. And my librarian pulled out scary stories to tell in the dark and read from said book. And it, the electricity I was talking about earlier, that it was like the whole room was set ablaze with these little five-year-olds like, oh my God, what is going on right now? What is happening? But we were, there was a buzz. And um, it was so inappropriate when I go back and I look at those stories and I have a five-year-old and I'm like, oh no, that's, we're not gonna do that. But it was really formative for me. And like Clay said, any kind of time in my life when I was, you know, struggling or going through something, I would always turn to horror and I could never articulate why. Like, why is that the genre that I'm going to? Because in school, I was always told that's not important enough, in quotes. Like, that's not an important genre, right? Um, there's, that's just genre fiction, et cetera. And it's, it's I don't remember, one of you said it was, it's, it's such an incredibly emotive genre that like it's just big feelings all the time people trying to face their fears people trying to be brave and as soon as I felt like I was allowed to embrace that I that's when I decided to write it yeah I think this is a this is a great thing to talk about a really important thing to talk about because horror when we first experience it and read it or see it on movies it scares us but at one point it seems to comfort us um, so what's going on there? Why does horror comfort people? I think because it's not afraid to go there. Like, I, I think when I'm, when I'm, you know, in a bad, like, place, for whatever reason, I gravitate to horror, because, like, it's the one genre that doesn't um, ignore, like, what it is you're feeling. Like, if, if I'm feeling bad, I want... Some, I don't know, I want something to make me feel worse. Like, I want, to, I want to fall into the feeling. I don't want something that's gonna make me feel better. I don't want something that's gonna put it in, like, great words. I want something that's gonna make me feel like, oh, you're there with me. Uh, like, I, I guess maybe, like, to not feel lonely. And, uh, like, you know, horror movies, the, like, the worst possible things happen, and you're just like, yeah, that's life. I, like, I'm there. Um, so for me, like that's, I guess that's uh, where the comfort part comes in, where like you can read such a, a harrowing, harrowing story, and at the end of it, like you're still alive, and like you, now you have this experience that you carry with you, and it is going to inform the rest of your life. Uh, that to me is like the the draw, and like why I keep coming back to it. I also just jumping off that, um, I feel. Like, I personally just, like, identify a lot with the horror genre in general. Um, horror is, you know, kind of like 
the other. Like it's not, it's very maligned. It's not, you know, mainstream. It's on the outside looking in. It's all about the other. It's inherently like a very queer genre. Um, and I have just always identified with that. Um, you know, I've always felt kind of on the outside looking in at other people. Um, so to me, horror in general, like I just, I really just identify with everything it, it embodies, everything it stands for. And um, I just, I, I think it is a very comforting genre for a lot of people, especially um, the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. Yeah, I think culturally, it's, it's interesting because like, I, I mean, Horror is also this massive umbrella that has so many different flavors and varieties. And like, I, I think to me, um, like when I think of Invasion of the Body Snatchers or Night of the Living Dead, the durability of the, the metaphor of the monster and how every, uh, every generation gets its no, new zombie or every generation gets its new body snatcher. And how I, it, that, you know, I think back to Grimm's fairy tales and how, like, these stories have been kind of, they're, they're the first stories we're told as children, and they're there to kind of either warn us about something, protect us from something, but to do that, they need to kind of scare us first. And I, I just, I feel like maybe it's just the, the books that my parents chose to, to read to me, but, like, the, the impact of being protected and, like, you have to, you have to kind of like engage or it, like there's gotta be a jolt up front to then say, well, don't go too close to the water because Jenny Greenteeth will pull, co you know, come out and pull you down. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I, I, for me, the, the kind of contained experience of uh, tapping into uh, trauma, the idea to kind of explore the, the kind of range of surviving, it is, there's an encapsulated, like finite story that is told, that is shared, and because of that, you get to tap something in yourself through these characters, through the narrative, and and then you you close it, you 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 put it down, and then it's yours to kind of process and filter through. And I I don't know, I you know I maybe rom coms do that as well in their own way, but horror in that way where it's writ large, it is operatic. And it, it, it just, it's, you're allowed to kind of swoon into these emotions. And that's, I don't know, that's so beautiful. Um, so, you know, I, it is such a bummer that like horror is maligned because it does allow you to just go through the range of emotions of like, everything's okay, no, nothing's okay. We're gonna get through this, maybe not. You know, like it's, I don't know, like it's, that's a beautiful thing. Well, I write um, for children. I write children's horror uh, for ages like eight to 14. And I also teach huh. middle school. Uh, so I'm with that age group a lot. Um, and the, there are, there's something magical about horror that um, when I have a group of reluctant readers in my seventh grade classroom, who are just like, I hate reading. No, nope, not for me. I'd rather, let, let's, anything else you can tell me to do, I will do. But don't make me read that book. And so I'm always like, okay, sure, we'll see about that. And I'll read them, um, I guess, like their generation's version of scary stories to tell in the dark is that homage anthology. Um, don't turn out, don't turn off the lights or don't turn out the lights. Don't any of you know that? It's, it's really good. And I will always choose stories to be like, let's check that reading, I hate reading theory you seem to have. And I'll read, I'll start a short story, I just did this Friday, read a short story and I'll stop. And every single jaw in that room is like, oh, I'm like, oh, but I thought, I thought we hated to read, right, friends? I thought we hated to read. So may, should I just, should we just do something else? And they're like, no, tell me what happens to the giant baby. So like, it's <laughs> like, they're, and that's, you know, like it pulls them in and reading is reading. And I feel like we need to kind of nurture that more. I won't go on a teacher tangent right now, but um, yeah, it, it there's something to be said for having these big monsters and also the metaphorical monsters that, you know, you were talking about earlier that 
kids in particular, like I grew up reading that stuff and loving it, and then I feel like it went away for a little while, and it's coming back for kids, and we need to embrace that and kind of celebrate that. I don't know if I answered your question, but no. that's how I feel. <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're hitting on something uh, like really important uh, thing that we've seen. Horror was kind of like down for a while, but we're seeing a huge surge in horror. I mean, Barnes & Noble has a horror section now again. What? I mean, it's been like 15 years, right? And, and it's back there, um, which is interesting. But I know a lot of us horror folks who've been around a while, we're kind of like, hmm. You know, we're kind of waiting for the other ball to drop. And we're also kind of feeling like maybe it's getting co-opted a little um, in a way. Like, we're, we're really skeptical. Um, like, piggybacking off on that, like, what do you tell somebody if they're like, well, I don't, I don't read horror. I'm not reading horror. And do you even, do you want to win them over? Or do you just say, that's fine, it's ours? <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, I guess I, I would, I would want to know what they read. Like if they were like, I don't like horror, I'd be like, okay, well, what do you like? And then I think I would also ask, do you like Steven Spielberg movies? Do you like James Cameron movies? Like there's a reason why, Every big uh, like luminary like starts off with a horror story, and it's like one because like they 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 sell, and two because they have like some some type of structure that like facilitates like better storytelling later on. Like Jurassic Park is has horror elements oh, in it, God, yeah. but it's like a, a like this you know adventure type movie. All of like Spielberg's films have like horror horror aesthetic. Um, I mean, Jaws and, is a serial killer. Exactly, and you don't, re and people like forget that stuff. Um, but it informs everything else. So um, I think they just don't realize how much like how much horror is in their life already. Right, right. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, isn't it? I, I mean, if someone were to say that, I'd be like, that's totally fine. Like, yeah. I, you know, like I. What is more exciting to me is the idea that be, you know, thanks to those end tables you know, more people are exposed to horror who need to find horror. And for me, the challenge has been less about like trying to reach readers who don't want to read horror, but more trying to reach readers who do want to read horror, who can't find the right horror to read. And, and I don't know, man, I, the, I was at the previous panel and we were talking, they were talking about Twitter. And I, I, I feel what, what was interesting is this notion that social media has connected booksellers and librarians and, and, and authors and readers. Like there's a, a, a strange tapestry of, of, you know, every kind of corner that's suddenly happening that, you know, I would never have talked to a bookseller in Massachusetts had it not been for Twitter. And it makes me, and there's uh, another one in Kentucky, and then there's another one in Virginia. And they're all talking to one another about our books. And that is astounding. Yeah. So it's, you know, the, to your point, it's coming back. And I think that's great. And I think what's also coming back is the power of the hand cell, which is, I think more booksellers are saying, hey, you know, you want to read something really cool, you should check out this book. And that word of mouth is something that is starting in the bookstores, and I think it's continuing in social media. And I think that's a really awesome thing. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, social media has done so much for so many authors. Um, you know, just piggybacking off what you had said, there are so many booksellers who are just connecting with one another on, you know, TikTok, um, Twitter, Tumblr, whatever, um, that are... We were just watching them, just being like, yeah, keep going, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's just, it's phenomenal. I mean, there are like, there are small press, indie press books in Barnes & Nobles now. I mean, that was like unheard of just a couple years ago yeah. um, for like little tiny micro press books to be in giant chain stores because of um, social media is it's absolutely outstanding and i i see it trending in that direction now where you know the the big books aren't necessarily the books that come out of the big four publishing houses but you know you know little indie presses that can compete with them as well i feel like i've also 
really on, I agree with what people are saying. I also feel like I've, and this is gonna sound so cheesy, especially on a horror panel, but like I've met, I've met people, like people who almost feel like mentors to me or people who have shouted out my book like when it came out right in fall of 2020 and you know, everything was still shut. Like, like I've found like a group of cheerleaders where we can like support each other. And I, I really find that to be quite special about the horror community in particular, because um, I'm also technically part of the, the you know, children's lit community, and it, I feel like my horror friends will shout me out more, or you know, try to build me up more, or be more honest, and uh, I am really grateful to social media for that, even though I do hate it 90% of the time. <laughs> yeah, I think it, the, the culture of, of horror writers is really strong. I mean, I think they're, it's, it's a family. I think, you know, we understand each other in a very profound way because I think we are called to this stuff and you, you, you know kind of what that other person's mindset is in a lot of ways. And the business is changing and, it, and it's a really, it's, you know, like Eric, you were, you were mentioning, like there's, there's a lot of different opportunities now. Um, one of the biggest changes I've seen is libraries, like this having events. Um, as libraries are changing and becoming like multimedia kind of havens, it's been an amazing thing to have them invite us in um, and say, hey, it's Halloween time, let's have a panel. Um, and I urge anybody who's not local to here because this is covered, but if you're somewhere else to, to ask your librarians, um, um, it's amazing. Um, so piggybacking off of that, what have libraries meant to you as a writer? Oh my God. Everything. I, my grandma took me to the library when I was a kid, and she'd be like, you got an hour, pick two books, any two books, I'll read one of them to you, and you get to read the other to yourself. So I always chose The Far Side by Gary Larson for me to read to myself, <laughs> and I asked her to read me um, North America's Greatest Monsters. <laughs> and every chapter was like, the Wendigo, the Kushtaka, like, I mean, it was, it was insane, like, and I, I asked for it, and she was like, no judgment, you know, you're, this is, you know, but I got to walk through the aisles of this, this, this library, the Bonaire Library, and it was, it was my call, and I got to pick the book off of the shelf, and, and that freedom and that privilege to be like, this one, and, I, you know, it, it's, it was very gratifying to kind of have access and to have the, the, the ability to choose and then to kind of articulate why I wanted those books. And uh, yeah, that was, that was fundamental. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, same. For me, libraries growing up were, I mean, that's where I discovered my love of reading and my love of writing. Um, you know, I started reading everything from like Agatha Christie to Harlan Ellison to, you know, eventually Clive Barker, um, you know, and my mom, uh, you know, would take me to the library like every weekend and we'd pick out like all the books I wanted to read during the week. And um, it was just, I always felt like really safe in libraries, like libraries I feel like are just safe havens. Um, just growing up, I just knew that like, every library I went to, like, I was gonna be, like, protected, and, like, there was, you know, all these books there, and, like, it was just an inspiring place to be, and um, when I knew, like, I wanted to be a writer, I just, it, it just always felt like a really, it felt like a second home. Um, so libraries, to me, are very, very important. Awesome. That's literally, the, I totally feel the same way. Like, there was, there's a sense of safety. Like, I wasn't gonna get beat up at the library. Right. <laughs> like, no one, no, no one that was going to torment me was at the library. Yeah. So like I could be at the library and plus it's just like everything's available to you. Like there's, there's no marker that says like, no, you can't take that book out. Like, no, I can't. It's at the library. So like it just felt like this like great freedom and this like space for you to do that. Like, and that to me is what like a, a library has always represented. Um, I hate, hate uh, public transportation, and I would jump on the train to go to the Harold Washington Library in Chicago, which is like this grand building. It's beautiful, uh, and I would go because like I loved that library. Um, so like that, yeah, that that to me is was, has always been what they've represented for me. 
Definitely same. I have like my favorite memories as a kid have been going to, I'm from Connecticut, I grew up in Stratford, um, and the Stratford Public Library is like a little bit goth, all made of stone, Stephen King, I tell people this all the time, it was in his book on writing, but don't come at me if I got this wrong, but I'm pretty sure he said in that book that he got the idea for it in that library when he lived there for a little bit as a kid, which I will always be like, Stratford, um, and he, <laughs> And, and I could see why it's super creepy. And so as a kid, I would take like little free creative writing classes there. I'd ride my bike there after school. And that's really where I started to learn how to write and craft a story. Um, and was with like-minded kids who were nerds just like me, who were, you know, super excited to learn, you know, how to make your protagonist cry or whatever the lesson of the day was. And there's a cemetery in the backyard and there's allegedly like a witch the Stratford, I'm just gonna, I love that library so much. Um, I still go back there, it smells a bit like feet, but I still go back there to write sometimes because of the ambiance and Stephen King. But libraries are everything and we need to, I wish there was more um, normalcy across the nation in terms of resources to make sure like all libraries have funding and have programs like this and have those little creative writing programs I used to go to. Um, yeah, they're amazing. Awesome. I just want to take a moment. I, my story echoes all of yours. And my mom, who's here um, in the back, it's her, it's her fault that I'm here right now. <laughs> she would take me to the library as a little kid, and I'd be like, I want this new Stephen King or the new Clive Barker. And we would sit there for hours. And then she, would, I think she gave me my first Anne Rice book to read. So um, shout out to my mom. Um, yeah. 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 Love you, mom. <laughs> How to do it. Sorry to embarrass you. Um, before we open it up for questions, I just I wanted to have one more fun question with you all. Um, what's one thing that readers may not know about one of your books or about you that you'd like to share? <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs> We're really nice people. Ish. I, I really, <laughs> I really enjoy liquid death, mountain water. Uh, Did I say it was refreshing? Refreshing. So refreshing. It's fantastic. Tastes just like water. <laughs> um, I guess I don't know. That's that's a tough one. Something about me or the book. Um, yeah. I, why did I pick up the microphone? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I stumped the band. I stumped the band. <laughs> Uh, do we do we have any questions? Um, that any, any? Uh oh, I stumped the audience too. <laughs> no, no, they're going. Oh, they're going. They're going. They're going. That's right. They got to go up to the microphone. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I have a quick question. Uh, right. It's an aspect I don't think you've covered yet. Um, my sense of horror readers is that they indulge in a guilty pleasure that they tend not to talk about. Uh, I know in my case, if I went to a block party and they said, what are you reading now? I'm not going to tell them I'm rereading H.P. Lovecraft, which I am. Um, and I don't know that that's a plus or a negative. It, 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 is our readership some kind of dedicated cult? And are they loyal? Uh, or should we be looking to somehow spread the word beyond the borders? You can totally come to my block. I, I think that would be, we could have a wonderful barbecue and talk about Lovecraft. But I, I mean, I think it's an interesting point of like mainstream versus something a little bit more uh, consolidated. I mean, like, I, I would say, I would argue in the last year or two, I have felt more embraced by a community of readers and writers than say, the previous 20 years of my writing career. And, and I think a lot of that probably has to do with social media, for, for better or for worse. But I, I think that um, I, it's so strange because I, you know, something that does feel so kind of like, is this a guilty pleasure? Should I be sharing this with anybody? But then you meet your kin, you meet your family, your community, and you can talk about it. And you could be like, do you want to talk about Lovecraft? Like, it's, you know, like, I, I don't want to read Lovecraft, but can I show you this new, uh, you know, Poppy Z. Bright? Like, it's, it's, it's you, I, I feel like the pool has widened because the platforms have, the, there are new platforms. Um, I, 
my, my wife doesn't read horror, but that's okay. My friends, you know, like, I, I find, you find your community. You find the people who uh, embrace it. Um, I, I, I feel like we've kind of taken over this day, this, this festival. Like, yeah. there are so many horror writers here, and it's amazing. And to be kind of a fan first and be like, Hello, hello, Mr. LaRocca. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm a big fan. Like, it just, it just feels exciting because they're like, they're people. And we're all just reading each other's books. Yeah, I would say, like, doing events like this make me feel, like, less of a freak. Because, like, I'll interact with other people that are really into horror. And it's like, there's no shame about it. You know, it's not a guilty pleasure. And, like, for so long, I was not, it, it's not that I wasn't like proud that I was writing horror, but I would kind of avoid it if it came up in conversation with just like people I had met for the first time. But now I'm at a point where I just like don't care. Like I'll, like I write horror and it's like, I feel like each person, like you have to get to that level of just confidence where you just don't, you don't care. But it's sad that that's what horror feels like sometimes. Like it's like a guilty pleasure. I do, I do like that, though, when uh, someone's like, oh, no, I, I'm, like, my family doesn't read horror. They're like, I, I don't like horror. And I'm like, good, because you don't want to read what I'm writing about us. <laughs> so, like, it's, like, this, like, perfect um, umbrella that I'm like, yeah, like, let's keep it, let's keep it culty. Let's keep it, uh, like, we're exchanging, uh, like, old burned CDs or something. It, and they're, they're, they're just, like, great stories. Uh, I, that's an element that I really do enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have much to add. I'm kind of the opposite, though. I kind of want to just scream about it all the time. Like, I'm giving it to my students in small doses. I'm, I, because I think Clay said it. It's like not, horror is not a monolith. Like, every, there's so many different types of subgenres within it that you can find something. And most people just need to be a little bit educated about what horror is and what it isn't. Because I think, you said it, like, a lot of people already like it and they just don't realize that's what it's called. I read a lot of horror, but unfortunately, it's a long time, or I read a lot of horror, but not a lot of it really scares me, and I want to be really scared. I was pleasantly surprised when the last Christopher Golden book, Road of Bones, really scared me. So this question is for each of you, including you, Mr. Palisano. Tell me briefly a scene in a book that really scared you and what the book was, because I'd like to read it. Wow. Any takers? The Cipher by Kathy E. Koja um, is one of the scariest books I've ever read. Uh, part, there's a, so, in this like dilapidated uh, apartment building in a storage closet, there is this hole in the wall. And uh, this like guy and his girlfriend find it. They nickname it the fun hole. And there's a scene where they like put a camera, like a video camera in the hole. What, what gets recorded on this video is like one of the most horrifying things I've ever read. Um, and to the point that I was like, I, I didn't go far enough in my own writing. Like, I didn't know that there was a level of, of this kind of horror that could like panic, panic me so, um, that that's a book that's like always stuck out to me as like one of the scariest things I've ever read. So by all means, like check that, check that one out. That, that's a really good book. Um, I'd, I'd address this by saying, um, I can't give you a scene. Because in horror, for me, the, the books that are scariest build up slowly. So it's not just one scene. It's an overall feeling of dread that, that I'm feeling. Um, the one that always comes to mind is Salem's Lot. Um, that, well, that scene and also when they first find Barlow, when they find, they, he realizes that the, the dirt is not from... Jerusalem's lot, um, like just, but, but all the setup really is what gets you, um, and that feeling, and, and you're walking around all day, and you're carrying this book with you, and that, that story with you, and you're, it just kind of, it changes you in a way, it makes you look at the world a little bit differently, like that one really came to mind, like immediately when you asked that. 
Yeah, I feel the same way. Like scenes, there are a few scenes that like really grab me, but like the overall book that I'm thinking of that just like really lingered in my mind was um, Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright. I mean, that book will like fuck you up. It is so good. Um, it's about this like serial killer, necrophiliac, um, and it's just, it's so unnerving. Poppy's writing is just um, so lyrical and just decadent. And, um, you know, that was another book where I was like reading it and I was like, this is what I want to do, you know, but it also just was so unnerving to, to read. Um, and that doesn't happen a lot when I read. So that book, I feel like, is, is just a masterpiece of the genre. I agree, a thousand percent. Uh, did you read uh, Cabin at the End of the World? Yeah. Paging Paul Tremblay, are you in the room? Oh. Um, did, okay, that, okay, so we'll not talk about that one. Um, did you read uh, Cunning Folk by Adam Neville? Okay, so there's a scene two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through, it happens, and it's kind of like a, a it, you know, I'm not, I can't give it away, uh, but it's a scene that happens <laughs> that really is, it's, you know, it's one of those moments where it's like, it's kind of a jump scare, but it's like, I, you know, jump scares in books are really hard to execute because you, you, you're taking, you're reading the book at your own pace and who knows if you're kind of in, like engaging with the text, but then you get to a sentence and you stop and you have to like, it's like, whoa, what, what just happened? And then you have to go back a couple sentences and reread and ramp up to it again. And you're just like, oh my God. And I had that moment with Cunning Folk by Adam Neville. And I would recommend it. I, I liked the book, but I, that moment was very effective. And it was, it was like, it, 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 it was that jaw drop moment of like, I actually need to stop time, rewind, and re-engage so that I can understand, and then the dawning of the horror kind of takes over. I hang out with a bunch of different writer communities, mystery folks and sci-fi folks and horror folks, and all writers are fabulous, but it wasn't until I actually met horror writers that they were, I realized they were so friendly and welcoming and supportive, and Lorraine, you mentioned that a little bit about people sharing stuff. Why do you think it is that horror writers are so well-adjusted and friendly and happy? <laughs> I don't know about the well-adjusted part, but I will say, um, I think because of what we write, it's just full of big emotions and just that human emotion and just that, like, making yourself vulnerable that when you meet someone else who does the same thing, you can connect like that. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? It's like um, when you meet someone who's like a metal fan and they're like the nicest, like warmest people ever. It's kind of like, it's because they already have a, they have a way of like getting all that bad stuff out. Um, and that's why they're like, these like great people to uh, talk to. I guess maybe that's what like horror writers are. I will second the uh, well-adjusted part. Like, yeah, that's not happening. But like, <laughs> um, yeah, like, like for whatever reason, I think it's because we're like spending so much time in these like, horrifying stories that once we're out and we're talking with people, we're like, hey, let's do the good parts only. Like, that, they, that's like the fun part uh, because we're just spending so much time like trafficking in, in just like the worst things. Yeah. Maybe, I, I mean, I, I feel like everyone says like, writers are empaths and they, they, they kind of, you know, that there's this emotional connection. And I, and I think that's true. And maybe the thing with horror authors is that they are feeling all of the emotions and kind of going through the range of emotions. But I also think to kind of tap in a community again, because you know, why is it that this subsect of particular, a particular genre of authors are so nice? Um, I think maybe it's because when you connect with other horror authors, horror readers, there's already a kinship, there's a, a community base there where it's like, ah, you share this commonality and that bond I don't know, there's something to be said about that, that kind of furthering emotion to kind of, uh, I don't know, just bring you closer together. 
Yeah, I think it's like almost like a secret society in a lot of ways. Like, you know, it's like a bond between writers um, because horror is looked down upon so often. Um, you know, it's like, oh, you write horror, I write horror. And like, it's, you know, you bond over that. And um, I, I also think like it's because we purge like a lot of our darkness on the page. And um, I agree with everyone else. I don't think we're necessarily well adjusted, but <laughs> it's, um, yeah, no, every, every horror writer I've met has been so, so kind and gracious. I did have an event where at the end, uh, someone was like, I, I thought you'd be like messed up. And I was like, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm not as messed up as you thought I'd be. We have time for one more question. Um, I feel like the older I'm getting, the more I'm rooting for like the morally gray or the villain or the monster. And I, I don't see myself like rooting really for the protagonist sometimes. I'm just like, okay, what's gonna happen? How do, how do these people develop these like villains or like the thing that we don't know like behind the closed door? So I'm wondering what your thought processes are when you're kind of developing like the thing or the, the thing that makes you scared. Like what's the, what's the process that comes with building that story around that kind of person or a monster? I mean, I love morally gray characters. Like I love like complex, I mean, people are, people in general are complex. Like they're not one, they're not black or white, like one or the other, like we're very complex. And, you know, um, I think it's always interesting to bring in um, really unique perspectives in fiction. And um, I, I just kind of um, pull from, you know, my own experiences, my own, you know, you know, uh, my own traumas. Um, and that's kind of where I delve from uh, to kind of create these hopefully complex, um, morally gray characters. Because I totally, like, that's totally my vibe is the morally gray character. <laughs> I think there's something um, that I'm drawn to, like, about, like, a like a story is like a gauntlet. Um, for whatever reason, that's, that's what, uh, uh, that's kind of like a form of, of a story that I just can't escape this idea of like putting characters through the ringer. So a lot of times what stands out to me are these like random details that I, that I think like I can then twist into like something scary. Um, and that like for whatever reason, taking the mundane and like finding a way to like make it terrifying, like that's what I like. I like ruining things for people. <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite thing. So um, yeah, whether it's like a smart speaker or like something I'll hear like on a podcast that like will stand out to me and I'm like, oh, that in the right context, that's scary. And I, now I'm gonna like bank that for something. So I have like uh, a folder on my phone of just like, scary things, like weird things that I'm like are scary and someday I'll find a story for it and then I'll plug it in and it'll be scary hopefully. Like that's how I go about it. I really wanna see that folder, I'm curious. Um, I'm terrified of like dying or losing it and then someone going through it and being like, what? like what is this? Like, what that are these? person who was like, I thought you'd be more messed up is, is gonna, gonna be like, was right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also have a little folder on my phone, but it doesn't have, it's more like weird titles I'll never use. Um, I, I just think of things that scare me and the biggest things that scare me are what scares everybody and you know, like just losing someone you love. And since I write for kids, I have to be a little more careful with that. Um, but losing someone you love, I feel like always kind of trickles into things I write. Yeah, I, I think, uh... You know, we're scared, I'm scared. I think we're just, there's like a, a level of fear right now that is making the, like just everything feels really scary. And, and how to kind of articulate that and process that and come out the other end feeling like we've expressed an emotion that, that the reader can kind of tap into as well. I think um, the, that grayness of, uh, you know, 
what's good versus bad is eroding to the extent that like the good guys are the monsters and the you know the monsters are misunderstood good guys and like you know I, I think like the it's you know it's interesting to hear you say like the older I have gotten the more I am beginning to identify with the the monster the villain I think it's that the more we are kind of aware and emotionally in tune to the world at large, that, that kind of divide between good and bad and monster and hero. Like it's, that, that, that is the thing that is kind of eroding away. Um, and it, you know, I, I think some of the more affecting stories to me that I've read are the ones where I, I have to kind of ask myself like, who's the, you know, well, you know, like I have to kind of check myself and kind of define for myself who is, who is what, or like what is the outcome of this that feels like, okay, is this a happy ending? Is this, like what's the toll of this story? Um, you know, it's, forgive me for making a cinematic reference, but like The Babadook uh, is a, a wonderful example of like, you know, coming out the other end of a narrative and, and you know, asking yourself, is that a, that feels like a happy ending, but is that, you know, like, and, and like just the kind of having the reader or the audience member try to question what is, what is this, out, what does this outcome mean and like the effect of that. And um, I don't know, like uh, that to me is the kind of quality of what we, we can do with these stories. Amazing. Well, thank you so much to my panelists. This was an amazing talk. I know we could talk for another couple of hours easily. Um, we will be over there signing books momentarily. Um, we do bite, but only if you ask nicely. <laughs> so just know that. Um, thank you to the library, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>